Today we're going to take a look at the Schaefer Standard Rotary Vane Actuator Package and discuss the operation and the features and benefits of the actuator and control. Here in front we have the directional control and manual hydraulic pump and speed controls. They're housed in a sheet metal cabinet. The directional control, the poppet block, is the heart of all of our actuator control packages. All the pilot or electrical remote operations are connected to the pop up block control, which provides both an automatic or remote operation, as well as local manual operation. Here you can see the handles for local operation. The handles are marked with open and closed tags. Left is open and right is closed. This applies to the pop-up block control and the local manual hand pump up here, open and closed. Also the gas hydraulic tanks left and right, open and closed. The pop-up block internals are illustrated here on this decal attached to the control cabinet door. And I have here a cutaway model also that controls a double three-way normally closed configuration. The power gas connection is here on the left. You can see here the power gas filter situated just downstream of the inlet port. The filter is a wire mesh stainless steel. Here are the two power poppets which are sitting on their seats until they are pushed open with the manual levers or by pilot pressure. Notice here the channel that extends the length of the block. On the other side is a secondary filter which carries the supply gas to any of the pilot valves or solenoids that provide the automatic or shutdown functions of the control. The pilot filter is very fine, about 10 micron, and does not require high flow capacity, only fine filtration to protect the more delicate control components. Here above each poppet are the pilot pistons. The internal pilot pressure is the same as the power gas pressure. Now let's take a look at the manual hydraulic pump. This pump went through a two-year design and proving phase before it was released for production. The main focus was safety. The balanced ram manual pump is a result of that work. The balancing of the ram or the piston is achieved by making the effective area of the top side of the piston and the bottom side of the piston equal. We extended a stem from the bottom of the piston so should the pump cavity become pressurized there is no upper force on the stem. Here in the discharge ports are the speed control valves. Opening and closing speed can be independently adjusted. The self-neutralizing feature is easy to demonstrate and I'll do that now. As you can see, the selector mechanism is linear. It's pushed from left to right to achieve that desired operation, open or close. In the middle section is located the neutralizing piston, which when pressurized immediately moves the selector back to the neutral position. This serves two purposes. One, if the pump is being operated while the controller receives a remote signal, the balanced pump ramp freezes in position. At the same time, the selector returns to neutral and the actuator moves to the position as signaled. As I operate the pump in a normal manner, the actuator is being cycled to the position selected, in this case to the open position. My assistant will simultaneously send the actuator a closed signal from a remote location such as the station control room. This action immediately causes the pump to move to the neutral position and the handle and pump ram to freeze in position. The pump handle does not fly up and the actuator is not prevented from operating via the remote signal. This button in the middle is a relief valve that allows you to get the ram back down after operation. What happened just then when the solenoid was energized, the pilot pressure entered here and pushed the poppet open, directing power gas to the closed gas hydraulic tank. At the end of the stroke, the limit switch de-energized the solenoid, allowing the control to return to neutral. The tanks and actuator are pressurized only while cycling. The tanks are always vented. While it is the pipeline operating pressure that causes the pump to neutralize, it requires less than 50 PSI to neutralize the pump. Let's move to the other side and discuss the actuator and gas hydraulic tanks. Here's the actuator motor itself. The Schaefer rotary vane actuator is the most rugged and compact design in the industry. Here's the scale model of the actuator and includes only one moving part, the rotor vane mechanism. It's situated perfectly concentric in the cylinder and is constantly lubricated by its own operating fluid. 
It produces what we refer to as balanced torque, meaning that since there's no change in moment arm length as it cycles, such as with the Scotch yoke designs, the torque is equal throughout the entire 90 degrees of rotation. This is very important when there are high flow conditions in the pipeline and the valve torque increases at mid-travel. There is no side loading effect on the rotor or the vane surfaces. Here you can see what we call the shoes. These are fixed permanently within the cylinder and they divide the actuator into four separate cavities. Here you can see the shoe bolts which fasten the shoes in the cylinder. Here are the ports of entry into the actuator. Notice how the pressure works on the veins inside. As the pressure is applied here, the vein is forced clockwise. So this is the closing port. By contrast, this port, when pressurized, forces the vein counterclockwise, so this is the open port. What are not visible are the internal crossover ports in the upper and lower head. The crossover ports allow both sides of the vein to pressurize simultaneously, thus producing the balanced torque. Here are the stop adjustments. Now looking at these, which are on the same side of the actuator, we can figure out which is the open and which is the closed adjustment by picturing the movement of the rotor and vein. The vein moves in this quadrant, so it, as it moves clockwise toward close, it will hit this stop. As it moves counterclockwise, it will hit this stop. The corresponding stops are 180 degrees opposite of each other. Regarding the subject of torque, here's a table that I've created to show the torque factor for each model. The torque factor is multiplied by the supply pressure to the actuator. I give a couple examples here. The model 9 by 7 has a torque factor of 72. So if my supply pressure is 1,000 PSI, the actuator torque produced at that pressure is 72,000 inch-pounds, 72 times 1,000. The model 12 and a half by 12 has a torque factor of 288. Now I've used a supply pressure of 500 PSI, which results in a torque of 144,000 inch-pounds, 500 times 288. This is how we match the actuator model to the required valve torque. By the way, the actuator models are based on the internal dimensions of the actuator. The first number being the internal diameter, the second number being the internal height of the cylinder in inches. Here are the gas hydraulic tanks. The tanks are constructed for ASME Section 8 code and are U-stamped. Each tank has a volume three times the volume of the actuator. For example, this model 12 and a half by 12 has an internal swept fluid volume of 490 cubic inches. Each tank therefore has a minimum total volume of approximately 1470 cubic inches. This arrangement provides for more than adequate space for the oil returning from the actuator and more than adequate fluid volume for cycling the actuator. The fluid level actually moves in the middle third section of each tank. Here, for example, is the closing tank, which is connected to the actuator via the manual pump into the closing port. When the actuator has completed this closed stroke, the fluid level will be about here, while the open tank, whose fluid has been forced into the return tank, will be about at this level. Each tank has a dipstick that will allow the fluid to be checked periodically. The dipstick is connected to the fill plug on top of each tank, each tank has a gas diffuser, which allows the gas to flow and spread out over the hydraulic fluid rather than shooting straight down into the fluid. This actuator is fitted with two solenoids to provide an electric remote two-way operation. Here are the two solenoids, which are mounted and pre-wired on the terminals in the limit switch. The solenoids are two-way, normally closed. They have an operating pressure of 1,500 PSI. Here's an exploded view of the solenoid valve. It's a simple design with no dynamic seals. It has a poppet pin of Lexan type material. The pin remains seated until the coil is energized. It's pulled up immediately to deliver the pilot pressure to the control. Here's the limit switch assembly. It's a Schaefer limit switch and it includes single pole, double throw mechanical type switches. The position indicator is on top. Let's take a look at the limit switch assembly and the built in terminals. The switches are hermetically sealed and they have a capacity of one amp at 24 volt DC. Here the solenoids are terminated. 
and are conduit ports for field connections. The switch enclosure has a Class I Division I rating, and the sturdy dome cover has an O-ring seal for all ambient conditions, including offshore. Well, I hope this has provided a good overview of the Schaefer actuator and control. We design custom controls for each application. We have about 30 or 50 control diagrams that we consider standards. The electric remote two-way control that we've demonstrated here is one of those. Line brake controls, both pneumatic and electronic, are widely used for pipelines and host of emergency shutdown controls for compressor stations and offshore platforms are also part of the mix. Our partial stroke control package has become increasingly popular in recent years. Schaefer rotary vane actuator has been considered the world standard for gas pipelines for more than 65 years. We hope that our video has been informative and we look forward to working with you on your next project. Thank you.